Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Wednesday, September 7th. And tonight, we're talking about stifling heat on the West Coast. California's power grid is at its limits, and this record heat could cause rolling blackouts. It feels like it's raining on us, just a heat rain. High temperatures remain well above 100 degrees, and California is still facing a number of deadly wildfires. A live report and the forecast are next. Meanwhile, a California man is on the run after bilking the U.S. Navy out of millions. We'll tell you how the man they called Fat Leonard scammed the military. Also, some long-awaited art went on display today in a restored White House tradition. Rock and Michelle, welcome home. Welcome home. More on the new official portraits of former President Barack and First Lady Michelle Obama. And Apple says its new iPhones can send calls via satellite. But do the new models offer enough to make you upgrade? Tonight, California is trying to conserve more energy than usual to avoid rolling blackouts. Record heat is keeping the AC blasting on high like never before. But yesterday, the state barely prevented an emergency on its power grid. Much of California is under excessive heat warnings. At least three cities in Northern California lost power briefly. So far, grid operators are not ordering rolling blackouts. So far. Yesterday, the state capital, Sacramento, hit an all-time high of 116 degrees. This morning, it set a new record low of 81 degrees, the highest low for this date. Forecasters say more records could break in the coming days. With the heat comes a greater risk of wildfires. Officials say the Fairview fire in Southern California killed two people. It has more than doubled in size since Monday. Meanwhile, Hurricane K is making its way up the Pacific coast. You see it's just west of Baja right now. But how will that tropical moisture affect the heat wave? Bill Karens will have more on that in just a moment. But let's begin with NBC Steve Patterson in Los Angeles with more on the heat. And Steve, I give you credit for standing outside the bureau instead of inside in the insane Los Angeles heat right now. How are folks doing just coping with these high temperatures? Uh, well, they're doing their best, Joshua, and they're doing anything they can. It's 5 o'clock right now here out west, still 100 degrees. That's just Southern California, nothing compared to Sacramento, Bay Area, Inland Empire, Central Valley, where you could be seeing temperatures right now, 105, 110, plus that. And right now, as we come on the air, we're in the second hour of our eighth straight flex alert in this, in this state, which is basically this period where California ISO, where the governor, office where government officials are begging people please stop using so much energy from now until about 10 p.m. that's when they send messaging out turn your thermostat up to 78 degrees don't plug everything in if you can try not to use appliances if you can all of that saves on energy usage that is so threatening to the grid right now which is under so much strain last night we broke the record more than 52,000 megawatts of energy more than California has ever seen in its history tonight we're already nearing 51,000 so we're right back in that threat zone which is what officials are so very worried about if people don't follow the rules Josh Steve people have dealt with rolling blackouts in parts of California before I know that California's ISO the statewide power grid regulator is contemplating the possibility of that people have got to be dreading it but if that came to pass, paint us a picture of what that would mean. I imagine that there are certain populations like, say, people who use oxygen tanks at home, first responders, level one trauma centers that are under an especially great need for power. And all of that has to be planned out if and when the grid decides to fail. 
Yeah, uh, and of course, you know, that's the reason why we use rolling or rotating blackouts is because it is a flexible system. It is built for that, right? So what would happen is essentially the ISO would contact local utility companies all across the state to say, hey, we're in a deficit of X amount of megawatts. We need that energy back or else the grid is going to fail entirely. And so what they do is they specify and they try to let people know about an hour or two in advance if blackouts are going to hit them. That happens. Those people lose power. But usually it's only for about one or two hours. And they try to avoid, of course, areas where there are trauma centers, where there are hospitals areas where there is more threat if they can. Thankfully, people are internalizing that, though, because we avoided this last night, thanks primarily or almost exclusively due to the fact that people listen to the messaging. We got one of those almost like an Amber Alert where it kind of takes over your phone, telling people, hey, it's time to conserve energy. People listened, according to the ISO. We lost about 2,600 megawatts of usage. 26 million text messages went out. They estimate that the crisis of us rolling into rolling black blackouts was gone in maybe just a few minutes from people saying, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and follow the rules. And in California really stepped up, but they may have to do it again tonight and again tomorrow and again the next day. So it's up to the tenacity of Californians to see if we can do this. Josh. Steve, before I got to let you go, what about just dealing with the heat? We've got this fire in Riverside County, the Fairview fire. The latest word from Cal yeah. Fire that we just got is that it's only 5% contained and it's burning about 9,800 acres right now. The governor is considering a bill that's on his desk to rank the severity of heat waves. I just got an alert on my phone from the New York Times on my way to the studio about a new study about the link between heat and mental health. So. All of this has got to be putting more pressure on Californians just to endure life there. How are people dealing with the prospect of more of this heat this year and who knows how long in the future? Well, I mean, people have to think about, you know, legitimate concerns about just normal life. I mean, stepping outside right now, first of all, I can speak to the mental health thing of me just trying to keep my words straight talking to you in this heat. Um, but it's very concerning for, for health care, for child care, of course. Uh, the fires, by the way, that fire that you just described, only 5% contained. We started the day with that fire being 2,500 acres. So the fact that it's close to 10,000 tells you how much this is driving the heat. The thing that I think officials are though most concerned about is apathy because this state has been dealing with stuff like this now for the better part of a decade. Uh, you know, a mega drought that is decades old, that has dried out the landscape, that is supercharging these fires. Uh, you know, officials don't want people to get uh, too apathetic about it because they need to pay attention to it in order to fight back against it, that climate change is real, that it's driving all of this, and that it's making life demonstrably worse for a lot of people, especially people of color in certain neighborhoods where there is no relief uh, from the heat. Minority groups, people in lower income situations, unhoused people, there are about 60,000 in this region. Imagine what it's like for them in heat like this. So all of this is important to think about. Uh, so many more ramifications to come with this heat just than complaining about being hot outside. Josh. Thank you, Steve. Please go back inside in the bureau before you combust, but we appreciate you giving us the perspective from outside for just a we'll few do. minutes. That's NBC Steve Patterson starting us off tonight from Los Angeles. So that's the picture on the heat on the West Coast, but when will the West Coast get some relief? And what about that hurricane I mentioned a minute ago? Let's continue now with NBC meteorologist Bill Karens. Hey, Bill. Oh, good evening to you, Joshua. And this has been an incredibly long duration heat wave. And this isn't just been your average heat wave. I mean, in some cases, this is a once in a generation heat wave. We're talking all time hottest temperatures set yesterday, San Jose and Sacramento. And those records, you know, it's not like a short period of record where it's like the mid 1900s. They go back to like 1877. That's 47,000 days in areas like San Jose and Sacramento. It was the warmest day ever recorded. So where are we as we go throughout this evening? It's still blue blistering hot. The power grid is still being maxed out. We still have about 50 million people in the West from Montana to Colorado. Most of Nevada and California are under heat advisors or heat warnings. The worst of the heat warnings have been in California. And today we saw temperatures soar. We hit 105 in Salt Lake City, only two degrees away from their all time record high. And Salt Lake City, that is the fourth time this summer alone hitting 105 degrees. Never happened before. Uh, so as we go throughout the next couple days, we're going to call it gradual cooling. Not a lot, 
just a little bit. Areas that are 110 go down to like 107. Uh, LA is actually going to be very hot towards Saturday. I'll explain why coming up. Vegas cools off a little bit in Salt Lake City. You can't wait for Saturday. 86 degrees will feel so refreshing. So here's what's going on. This is the little fly in the ointment. We have a hurricane that's off the coastline of Mexico. This isn't in the Gulf of Mexico. This is off the Pacific side, off the Baja of California. Here's Cabo San Lucas. It's pretty much due parallel to that. And it's a category two, so a pretty strong hurricane. It's also a pretty big hurricane too, very wide. Already the clouds from this are streaming into areas of Arizona and New Mexico. So as this comes northwards over the next couple of days, the clouds are going to increase and eventually a little bit of rainfall too. You see that path along the Baja and then it curves right before it gets up to Southern California. But notice how close this cone of uncertainty is here, even to San Diego. Will a tropical storm hit San Diego? No, that's highly unlikely, but we could get some of the rain, the clouds, and also some gusty winds too. So here's what the rainfall forecast looks like and we're going to have a chance for some significant flash flooding in the desert and mountainous areas of Southern California. This would be Friday into Saturday morning and notice the possibility even some rain in Los Angeles, maybe one to two inches. So we love that for all the drought conditions, but of course we don't want to have to deal with flash flooding and mudslides and things like that. So we are under a moderate risk of flash flooding and very unusual from El Centro to Palm Springs come Friday into Saturday. So Joshua, we go from blistering all time record heat to tracking the tropics in Southern California. What a week. Never a dull moment. Thank you, Bill. That's NBC meteorologist Bill Karens with the forecast. Let's move on to some developments in two separate cases, both linked to former President Trump. The first involves former Trump strategist Steve Bannon. Tomorrow, he plans to turn himself in on charges here in New York State. Two years ago, President Trump pardoned him for federal charges. A statement from Mr. Bannon calls these state charges against him, in his words, phony. Prosecutors say this indictment involves a charity that claimed to raise private funds for building the U.S.-Mexico border wall. Meanwhile, there's new reporting on the documents seized from Mar-a-Lago last month. According to the Washington Post, one document describes a foreign government's military defenses. That includes its nuclear capabilities. We do not know which government was referenced, nor the classification level of this document. Now, the U.S. recognizes nine countries as nuclear powers. There they are on the screen. Pakistan, India, China, Russia, North Korea, and so on. Theoretically, it could be one of them. The Post cites people familiar with the matter as its sources. The Post also reports that the other seized documents detail U.S. operations that are so secret even some senior national security officials don't know about them. The Post says that is according to people familiar with the search. Now come back, to be clear, this is the Washington Post's reporting. NBC News is working to independently verify these claims, and the Justice Department has declined to comment so far. A Trump spokesperson accused the Post of acting as, quote, the propaganda arm of the Biden administration, unquote. And all of this comes after a federal judge approved the Trump legal team's request for a special master to review the seized documents. NBC Justice reporter Ryan Riley joins us now with more. Ryan, I asked this question with a great deal of sensitivity because we shouldn't know anything about documents with nuclear information. But what do we know about these documents and the information that might be in them? Well, I think it increases uh, the level of seriousness about what this is. We know the category of all of these documents. That's been pretty well spelled out in a lot of these underlying uh, documents. And one of the complications of bringing forward uh, a case like this is that you have to disclose some of these, some of this information uh, to the jury. Now, there are protocols uh, for how you can actually go about that and, and ways that you can disclose things to a jury but not let it get out in a sensitive, uh, in a sensitive issue that shouldn't be in, in the broad public. So there are ways to bring forward these cases, but they basically have to decide what things they can kind of disclose in this semi-public form if they decide to ultimately bring this uh, to a prosecution and, and what they need to hold back. So it's part of the calculus for the bringing these charges, which is why sometimes uh, the Justice Department decides not to move forward with the prosecution in cases if the information is just too sensitive to get out there in any matter whatsoever. It is part of the broader uh, analysis that they have to do before they bring any of these cases forward, Joshua. 
Can I just underscore the point you just made? It sounded like you said that if the information that the Washington Post has reported on and whatever else is in these documents is extra sensitive information, is truly of a nature that releasing anything about it would be too dangerous, the Justice Department might not prosecute for the reason of keeping that private information as classified as they possibly can, that that might negate a possible prosecution just to prevent them from becoming public. Did I hear you right? That's right, yeah. I spoke with someone earlier uh, this week who actually handled these sort of matters when he was inside the Justice Department, and he said that this was indeed part of what they have to analyze. It's, it's referred to as gray mail, this idea that uh, you can essentially have information that is, you can't get out in any way, uh, and that's part of the thing that you have to think about when deciding whether to move forward uh, with a prosecution. Now, there is a law that allows some of this to go forward. You know, the jurors basically get this information, but it's not referenced in open court in terms of specifics. It's only referenced in general ways, but essentially the jurors can get sort of permission or temporary permission to be read into some of this. But on these super secret things, it really gets pretty complex because suddenly stuff that only should be, uh, you know, known by cabinet members is known by just your average Joe juror who gets pulled in uh, to a jury room, although there would be some redactions there. But they have to get to the essence of what the actual information is in order to convict someone uh, of a charge to go forward. So it definitely is part of what makes this a really complex complicated call, uh, I think, for Merrick Garland ultimately here, if they ultimately bring this forward, Joshua. So setting that possibility aside, that some of the info could just be too sensitive to put in any kind of a court proceeding, setting that aside, help me think through the rest of the possibilities here. It, it, it makes me wonder if at a certain point, it kind of doesn't matter what the nature of the information is in the documents because we already know that it crosses through many classifications of information. Some of it was marked never to be shown to foreign governments. Some of it was marked not to be shared with anyone unless the permission of the person person who wrote the document was given. Some of it was marked to have come from human intelligence, in other words, spies. So at this point, do the details of the documents matter in terms of whether to prosecute other than what you described in terms of super secret secrets? Does it kind of matter beyond that? Yeah, you know, that's actually a really good point. I do think that the the volume of the material is a major component of this. I was just tallying this up uh, the other night, and if you go through everything we got in January, in June, and then in August, and that's, you know, initially when they turned over these documents to the National Archives in January, that's when there was a subpoena that was uh, responded to in, in June, and that's when the ultimate search warrant was executed uh, in August. You get very quickly to nearly a 1,000 pages of classified documents. We know there were 700 pages in that first batch. We know there were 38 documents. We don't know the page numbers in that second batch in June. Um, and then we know that there were hundreds of pages of documents. So even if you completely lowball that 100, that gives you 200 right there. You're very quickly up to you know uh, 938 being the absolute bare minimum here. In reality, I think the scope of this is more likely in the 1400, 1500 range uh, of classified uh, of pages of classified documents that were in Donald Trump's possession. Uh, you know, more than a year after he left office. So I think that that is what really could bring this uh, to uh, fruition and could really push, I think, DOJ uh, to to do something about this because there are just such an overwhelming amount of documents. Of course, the real thing that's going to, I think, put this over the top uh, is if they can prove that there was obstruction of this ongoing grand jury investigation and that Donald Trump himself was involved in making sure that those documents that were supposed to be uh, get turned over in response to that grand jury subpoena in late May, early uh, June. If he was involved in any way in the obstruction of that and DOJ can prove that and put it over the top, I think that's when this really uh, could de there, I think there would be a very serious case uh, for Garland to move forward, despite all of the, you know, the backlash that that would frankly create in uh, in the country and, and really put us in a pretty unprecedented um, area that we haven't been for, uh, to before in American history, Joshua. And briefly, before I have to let you go, what's the timeline from here? We know that the federal judge has granted the request for a special master to review these documents that the former president's legal team requested. How does that affect the timing of all this? 
I think we find out tomorrow whether or not they're going to appeal or whether they're going to go the special master route. They might come back and say, hey, we need some more details here. You're kind of making this up as you go along. We need uh, we need to know what we should actually do here because there's not really a the special masters haven't really handled this these questions of executive privilege before. We really are in uncharted waters here. So um, they, I think basically we should know by tomorrow whether or not they're going to appeal or if they're going to go the special master route and see how this plays out because those filings are going to be due on Friday, Joshua. All right. Thank you, Ryan. That's NBC Justice reporter Ryan Riley with the latest from our Washington Bureau. Still to come, a closer look at the 2020 election deniers who are running for office now. Plus, the debate over debates. Will Georgia's Senate nominees find common ground and take the stage? We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. The Senate race in Georgia is heating up. Incumbent Democrat Raphael Warnock is taking on Republican nominee Herschel Walker. And now they're negotiating terms for a debate. NBC's Ellison Barber has more on that. In Georgia politics, we are debating debates right now. The Republican candidate Herschel Walker previously said that he was willing to debate the incumbent Democrat, Senator Raphael Warnock, at the time and place of the senator's choosing. The senator then announced that he was willing to participate in three different debates. Then Walker announced that he was willing to participate in a debate that was not among those three the senator had said that he would participate in. Since then, the campaigns have gone back and forth, arguing and criticizing each other over not participating in the debates that the other side has already agreed to. But this morning, there was perhaps a glimmer of hope that an agreement might be on the horizon. Senator Raphael Warnock's campaign says they are willing to meet Herschel Walker at the debate in Savannah, Georgia, that he has already agreed to. To if Walker and his campaign are willing to say that they will not accept any sort of topics prior to debate night, and also if they will agree to one of the other two debates that Senator Raphael Warnock has already said he will participate in. Senator Warnock's team has a new ad out criticizing Walker for agreeing to the one debate where they say topics would be given to the candidates beforehand. Listen. Herschel Walker said. I'm ready for uh, Senator Warnock. When he's ready to debate, he called the time, he made the place, I'm ready to go. But like always with Herschel, there's a catch. Now Walker says he's only willing to debate once. And to do so, he needs to be given the topics ahead of time. That's right. Herschel Walker refuses to debate unless he already knows the topics. Quit the games. Agree to debates. Show us if you're really ready to represent Georgia. I'm Raphael Warnock, and I approve this message. Walker tweeted a response writing in part, quote, I don't need debate topics. I've accepted the Savannah debate without conditions. He should too, but he's playing games. Let's do this debate for the people. Both candidates have launched bus tours to try and win voters across the Peach State. Walker kicked his off today. Warnock started his about three weeks ago. This is an incredibly close race. The most recent poll from Emerson College had Walker ahead of Warnock by two points, but neither candidate at the 50% threshold. And in Georgia, that's critical because in order for a candidate to be declared the winner on election day, they have to receive at least 50% of the vote. Otherwise, they go to a runoff in December. Back to you. Thank you, Ellison. That's NBC's Ellison Barber reporting. You know, we're watching a number of big races for senator or for governor, but in many swing states, the races for secretaries of state and attorneys general are just as important. Some of these candidates could be instrumental in their state's election processes, and that includes certifying results, running elections, or litigating on behalf of the state over contested races. But a number of these candidates continue to deny the results of the 2020 presidential election. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard has more on that from Phoenix. Hey, Vaughn. Joshua, we have seen the sizzling that has led to this moment, which we could say is the boiling point, in which you are looking at around the country, but especially here in Arizona, these election-denying candidates who are the Republican nominees in these major general election races. I think Arizona is the perfect example, because here in the state, uh, the certification of election results, it requires the signatures and the sign-off from three different people, the governor, the secretary of state, 
and the Attorney General. In 2020, two of those three individuals were Republicans, Doug Ducey, the governor, and Mark Burnovich, the Republican Attorney General. Well, both of them, they certified the election results. And you saw that in other states where Republicans, despite Joe Biden winning, they certified their election results. But now you have seen a careful, uh, a careful play by these Trump loyalist candidates who have called into question the results of the 2020 election, a run for these important positions, and even campaign on the idea that they'd decertify the 2020 election. But better yet, it would call into question whether they would certify Joe Biden or another Democrat's win in 2024 on the ballot. Uh, in Arizona, you have Kerry Lake for governor. You've got Mark Fincham for secretary of state. Abe Hamaday is the Republican running for attorney general. Each of these individuals have uh, said that they would not have certified the 2020 election. But you're also seeing these type of candidates from Michigan to New Mexico to Minnesota. These are candidates that could call into question, again, whether if a Democrat were to win, whether they would go along with the system as we have seen play out over the course of our history. I want to let you listen to two of the candidates here in Arizona who I talked to, the two Democrats, the one Adrian Fontes running for Secretary of State and the one running for Attorney General, Chris Mays. Talk about the extent to which they are making the threat to democracy at the forefront of their bids running against these exact type of candidates. Take a listen. Well, the threats of democracy could not be any worse right now. We're talking about folks who do not want democracy to run in a normal way. You pull that thread out, all of society is going to end up disintegrating. I think we take it for granted, or at least we have, how important the operation and administration of elections are. I'm running for Secretary of State so that we can just call balls and strikes and make sure that we don't have wild-eyed extremists running our elections. American democracy runs through the state of Arizona in 2022, especially in the attorney general's race. I mean, my opponent has said that he wants to decertify the 2020 election, would not have certified the 2020 election, and he wants to eliminate vote by, by mail, among other things. So it is absolutely central uh, in these AG races, not just in Arizona, but all across uh, this country. That's where the importance of the 2020 election comes into play, because these folks are they're running for four year terms. They would have their hand in the 2024 presidential election and have ignored the realities of the results that happened in 2020. And that is why you have seen uh, uh, an exponential growth in the amount of campaign cash and contributions that have made their ways into these down ballot races and the amount of tension that is being paid to these races that usually is given towards Senate and governor's races. This time, though, there's so much attention being paid to the secretary of state and attorney general's uh, races. Joshua. Thank you, Vaughn. That's NBC's Vaughn Hilliard reporting from Phoenix. We will get to some of today's other top stories in just a moment, including an uptick in COVID cases as kids head back to school, Ukraine calling for evacuations near the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, and the Obamas returning to the White House to bring back a long-standing tradition. Traditions like this matter, not just for those of us who hold these positions, but for everyone participating in and watching our democracy. Tonight's headlines begin in Ukraine. Residents near the Zaporizhia power plant are being urged to evacuate. The ongoing fighting in the area is leading Ukraine to consider shutting the plant down entirely. But that would leave about four million people without power. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin is lashing out at the West's response to his invasion. He is calling economic sanctions, in his words, stupid. NBC's Jay Gray has the latest from Ukraine. Hey, Jay. Joshua, let's start at that nuclear power plant, the largest in Europe right now. The vice prime minister of Ukraine has urged anyone in the area with the possibility to escape do so. That because of the heavy shelling as much as anything in that area, but also the nation's top nuclear inspector has said that he has very real concerns about the integrity of the facility and he's considering closing it down, though it's not clear how he would do that since it's currently under Russian control. We know there's significant damage there. We know that there's been calls for a demilitarization around there, a safe zone, but to this point that just 
hasn't happened. Vladimir Putin also today really striking out uh, against the U.S., against the sanctions being levied uh, against his country, uh, saying that Russia's lost nothing during the campaign here in Ukraine, also saying that the sanctions aren't working, at one point calling them stupid. He also says that the U.S. is trying to bring Europe down as a part of what's happening here. So we'll continue to watch all of that. For now, though, that's the very latest here in Kiev. I'm Jay Gray. Back to you. Kids across America are getting back to school, but not all of them are vaccinated against COVID. Less than half of kids between ages 5 and 11 have received at least one dose. NBC's Lester Holt discussed this with Dr. Ashish Jha, the White House COVID-19 response coordinator. Lester asked if the country should do more to keep classrooms safe. Joining us now is Dr. Ashish Jha, the White House COVID-19 response coordinator. It's always good to have you here. We're barely into the school year, doctor, and already we're seeing an uptick in juvenile COVID cases, up 14% last week over the prior two weeks. Is it too early to begin reconsidering the COVID guidelines in schools? Yeah, first of all, Lester, thanks for having me back. Um, you know, we expected some of this. As, as kids get back to school, you are going to see more mingling, more people spending time indoors. I, I think the key is that we want to make sure people are protected. And the best way to do that for children is to get them vaccinated because uh, vaccines both prevent infection but also really prevent serious illness. That should be the number one goal. And I know you've been heavily delivering the mantra about vaccinations, but the reality only a third of kids ages 5 to 11 have even received a first dose. What's going wrong there? I think what we've always said about kids and kids vaccines is that these things take time and when I think back to December of 2020 when the first vaccines came out only about a third of adults said they'd get vaccinated. Now we know that 80% of adults have gotten fully vaccinated. What we want to do is encourage parents to talk to their pediatricians uh, talk to their trusted voices in their community. Um, I think as that happens you are going to see more and more children get vaccinated. If you were someone who only has that initial two dose uh, vaccine combination and have not had a booster shot to this point. Are you in increased danger? No question about it. If you have not had any additional shots beyond that first two, uh, presumably it's been a year, year and a half since you got it, uh, your protection at this point is far more limited. For that group, for everybody, but for that group particularly, I think it's critical to go out and get this new updated bivalent vaccine. I really do think it's going to make an enormous difference. All right, Dr. Jha, good to see you. Thanks so much for coming on with us. That was NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt speaking to the White House COVID coordinator, Dr. Ashish Jha. HIV is preventable with daily medications. The Affordable Care Act requires covering those drugs, but today a federal judge in Texas blocked that mandate on religious grounds. The decision involves drugs like Descovy and Truvada. They're part of a regimen known as PrEP. The court ruled that this mandate violates the religious liberties of Christian-owned businesses. No word so far on whether the federal government will appeal. The CDC credits PrEP for slowing HIV transmission. These drugs helped reduce new infections from 2015 to 2019. It was a historic day at the White House today, and kind of a family reunion, too. President Biden welcomed back former President Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama. The occasion? the unveiling of their official White House portraits. Here's NBC Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker. It was a first family affair. Rock and Michelle, welcome home. <laughs> welcome home. For the country, a return of a White House tradition. For Michelle Obama, her first visit back in more than five years. Michelle, he knows, we all know, he couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> The former president, nostalgic. When people ask me what I miss most about the White House years, uh, it is not Air Force One that I talk about, although I miss Air Force One. <laughs> it's the chance that I had to stand shoulder to shoulder with all of you. A reunion of a political partnership forged over two terms. We trusted him, all of you in this room. We believed in him, and we counted on him. And I still do. Joe, it is now America's good fortune to have you as president. Mr. Obama thanking artists Robert McCurdy and Sharon Sprung, quipping the portrait of Mrs. Obama captures what he loves most. Her grace, 
her intelligence, and the fact that she's fine. <laughs> Let me uh, thank my husband, first of all, for such spicy remarks. <laughs> An emotional Michelle Obama saying the portraits stand for something larger. A girl like me, she was never supposed to be up there next to Jacqueline Kennedy and Dolly Madison. And it is so important for every young kid who is doubting themselves to believe that they can too. That is what this country is about. The bipartisan tradition goes back decades. You will now be able to gaze at this portrait and ask, what would George do? <laughs> but former President Trump did not invite Mr. Obama, a mutual decision, according to sources. Still, this moment particularly poignant for the first black president and first lady who will live on these walls for history. Kristen Welker, NBC News, the White House. Still ahead, he was the mastermind of a breathtaking scandal at the U.S. Navy. Now he's on the run, just weeks before his sentencing. More on the man they called Fat Leonard when we come back. Almost a dozen law enforcement agencies are on the hunt for Leonard Francis. He was the mastermind of a historic bribery scandal targeting the U.S. military. Mr. Francis, a.k.a. Fat Leonard, used to be a military contractor. Here's the wanted poster from the Marshals. He had been on house arrest in San Diego, due for sentencing in a few weeks. But officials say he cut his ankle monitor off on Sunday. Neighbors say they saw a number of U-Haul trucks at his house in the days before his escape. Leonard Francis is a Malaysian national. He pled guilty to his crimes in 2015. Prosecutors say Francis bribed top Navy officials for years. That earned him millions in Navy contracts and got him access to military intelligence. He has since worked with federal prosecutors as an informant against other suspects in the scheme. But where is Fat Leonard now? And how did this scam go so far for so long before he was caught? Joining us now is Greg Moran, a staff writer for the San Diego Union Tribune. He and his colleagues were the first to report on this story. Mr. Moran, welcome. Good to have you with us. Oh, happy to be here, Joshua. What more do we know about the escape? I mean, ankle monitors, I thought, were supposed to go off when you cut them off so that you could be caught quickly. How did this guy get away? Well, that's a great question, and we're still trying to piece that timeline together. It's, it's kind of incomplete. What we do know is that, uh, according to the, the U.S. Marshal's Office here, the uh, uh, pretrial services agency that was monitoring him on this house arrest picked up some kind of what they are describing only as an anomaly with his GPS bracelet sometime on Sunday. Uh, they asked his defense lawyers to uh, go out and check and see what was going on. Uh, and sometime shortly before 2 p.m., the defense lawyers came to this house where he was staying in, in a very unusual living situation that he was under. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, they had called the San Diego police to, to check on his welfare. Some time went by, and uh, the police eventually were able to enter the house uh, in this gated community in a very nice area of San Diego. And the house was empty except for apparently one thing, which was his shorn-off GPS bracelet. Uh, lying there. Tell us more about exactly what this man was accused of doing and pled guilty to doing. It, it, it sounds like from your reporting that it involved tremendous amounts of bribes, hotel rooms, fancy dinners, prostitutes, though a number of naval officers were never quite, that the, the charges of, of associating with those prostitutes were never quite substantiated. But he spent a lot of money over a long period of time to get access to many millions of dollars of Navy contracts. Is that right? That's exactly it. It, it is, and it was, in the, and those are the kind of the salient facts. This was a very long-running scheme that he uh, really controlled and masterminded for at least a decade. Uh, I've talked to people who think it probably went on longer than that, that really followed a, a very similar pattern. He would identify officers or civilian contractors or uh, you know, sailors in in the Navy that were operating primarily in the Seventh Fleet, which uh, operates in in Asia, and uh, kind of ply them with 
the, with those kinds of gifts. Uh, very expensive dinners, uh, lots of champagne, uh, prostitutes, the services of prostitutes, uh, uh, trips that he would pay for for them to get away for a weekend with their family or whatever. And in exchange, these individuals would do a series of things for him. They would uh, use their influence in the command structure of the Navy to get uh, ships uh, to visit ports around Asia where Leonard and his company had contracts to provide services to, to ships that come into port. Water, food, uh, security, um, you know, removing sewage from the, uh, from the ship and so forth. Uh, once in the port, being serviced by Leonard's company, he then gouged the Navy and the United States taxpayer out of tens of millions of dollars by overcharging, fraudulent charges that many of these uh, individuals would kind of run interference for him and get those bills approved. Uh, they would uh, 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 also run interference for him in bad-mouthing other ship servicing companies that were vying for the contracts to make sure that Leonard got those. So it was one of the prosecution and these now nine years of cases here in San Diego, it was a very direct uh, uh, exchange of bribes for services. The interesting thing to me right. is that Leonard really spent about half a million dollars uh, total on these bribes over this period of time. And he gouged the taxpayer of at least $35 million. So that's a pretty good yield. So for lack of a more polite way to put this, whose butt gets kicked for this? I mean, this is a lot of money to steal from the military over an extremely long period of time. And it's not like nobody saw activity at his house. There were U-Haul trucks. Whose butt gets kicked for this? How, how do we make good on this escape, make sure that he goes to, to prison for the crimes he pled guilty to and that the Navy doesn't get taken in like this again? Well, great question. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that the that federal authorities here in San Diego across the spectrum are trying to figure out is, I mean, clearly they're trying to find him. As you said, there's a number of agencies looking for him. But this is a colossally embarrassing event for the Department of Justice, for the court system, which was uh, keeping tabs on, on him, in a sense, for the judge who was overseeing this. You know, he was in this living situation. He was living in a house and not he was not in a jail or a lockup facility because he had and he's been doing that for four years at least uh because he had very serious medical problems that couldn't be treated in jail so under this extremely unusual arrangement they granted him a medical furlough where he was able to live in residential settings pay for his own security he had 24 7 security private security and get and pay for and get this medical treatment um so and this had gone on largely without uh, event for several years, but now there's all kinds of questions. Where was the security? Not just on the day he left, but you know they're supposed to be there 24 hours a day. What are they saying when these U-Hauls are pulling up and he's you know unloading them up at, at night? Where's the security? Where was the pretrial services? This agency that was supposed to be keeping tabs on him. You know I don't think it's any coincidence that he made his dash on a holiday weekend. You know I don't. Right. Maybe they knock off early on Friday. Who knows? So, uh, you know, there is going to be uh, a lot of fallout from this about who was supposed to be doing what and when uh, to let this fellow who really orchestrated what is clearly the largest scandal in the Navy, certainly in, in half a century, if not longer, um, just slip through their fingers. Well, we will see who the fallout falls on and how far he goes before he is apprehended, if he is apprehended. Greg Moran of the San Diego Union Tribune, appreciate you talking us through this story. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Apple unveiled its newest iPhone today, but how different is it from the current models or from the competition? We'll take a look before we go. It's been more than 15 years since Steve Jobs pulled the first iPhone out of his pocket, and now the 14th iPhone is on the way. Today, Apple announced that it will release the new iPhone a week from today. It emphasizes enhanced safety features like satellite connectivity and sensors that can detect car accidents. 
it's easy to see why Apple keeps making iPhones. It's because the world keeps buying them. Lots of them. Check out Apple's third quarter report to investors. The report shows that it made more than $40 billion in revenue just on iPhones. $40 billion in one quarter. That's nearly doubled the sales of Macs, iPads, wearable devices, and home accessories combined. Joining us now is CNBC contributor Tim Higgins. He covers Apple as a tech reporter for The Wall Street Journal. Mr. Higgins, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Do I need this new iPhone? I got an iPhone. It's very nice. Works perfectly fine. What's the new phone got that I ain't got? Well, if you don't have 5G, this will have 5G. And that's really uh, the feature that was introduced in late 2020 that's uh, seen this boom in new sales for Apple over the last couple of years. But that phone, that the iPhone tw uh, 12, uh, helped revenue increase 40% in the iPhone category. Uh, that year. And then this year, we're expecting to go up 7% and potentially next year, another few percentage points, which is really dramatic for a company that's already so large. So is this new phone, the iPhone 14, that much different than the 12 and the 13? No, but it's probably pretty different than the iPhone 11, if that's what you're uh, holding on to there. I've got, well, this is the 13. So if I've got a 13, it's not that different from the 14, but if you're further back, then maybe it's worth an upgrade? Yeah, the, the big changes in the last couple of years are this ability to connect to the faster uh, Internet, if you will, through 5G connectivity. That's a big change. This new 14 family improved cameras. Uh, the real big changes occurred in the more expensive pro versions. Those are the ones that start for almost $1,000 and go higher. And this is where you're seeing uh, more advances in the camera. The new zoom capability is even more impressive, if you will. Uh, there's a change to the, the little notch on the front, uh, the front face of the camera. Now it's more of a pill-shaped uh, oval. Uh, and the screen will turn on. It has the ability to be on all of the time. And so the big changes are on in the high end, in large part because that's where Apple is making a lot more money these days. The last few years, we've seen customers go to the higher-end phones. The average selling price has gone up uh, in an incredible amount compared to just a few years ago when the iPhone 11 was out there. And that's in large part because your cell phone provider service, the carrier, is offering such great deals that yeah. for many people, you might as well get that more expensive one. A few more things before I got to let you go. This satellite connectivity feature, what's the big deal with that? I mean, we already use satellites to some extent with phones. You know, GPS relies on satellites in space, but do I need to make calls by a satellite? What's the, what's the benefit of that? Yeah, well, GPS uh, allows for positioning, uh, but traditionally you haven't been able to communicate with your phone, a traditional phone, up to those satellites. So this technology, this breakthrough will allow for emergency text messages uh, to be relayed in case you're out in, in the middle of nowhere and you break your leg uh, or you're hurt or something happens, you can get uh, help sent to you. So that's the big breakthrough here and the, kind of one of the newest things that Apple is, is offering. I have wondered about Apple's strategy for a while since the death of Steve Jobs, God rest him, and the ascendancy of Tim Cook. I'm kind of confused other than the economics as to why we need another iPhone. I mean, it's been a long time since we had a and one more thing moment from Apple that kind of made the world's hair blow back. I mean, Apple Watch took a while to catch on. Air tags are still kind of creepy. And the new phone just kind of incrementally moves along. Is Apple done wowing the world? Have they kind of found their way forward and they're just going to ride it to more billions and billions? Or is there more innovating to come? Well, Tim Cook has definitely figured out a way to, to squeeze more money out of customers. You've got a, a, a very new phone there, and I bet your digital life is entirely in that Apple ecosystem, and it's very hard to, to go to an Android phone. So I bet within the next year or two, you will be upgrading to another phone. You're probably spending more money through Apple TV, Apple Music, Apple Fitness. That subscription model, those digital services are where Tim Cook is hoping to grow the business in the future. That recurring revenue, uh, you know, time in and time again, 
that's where uh, a lot of the growth could potentially be for Apple in coming years. And then let's talk about other hardware. We might have an uh, extended reality headset in the next few months. And we know that Apple has been at least exploring the idea of a car. And before I got to let you go, what about Apple's competitors? I know Samsung has this new foldable phone, a flip out phone that it's just unveiled. There are other phones besides iPhones. How are they doing in terms of finding their niche in the market these days? Well, the challenge in the past quarter is global smartphone sales are in the decline. Apple has been bucking that trend in part because the, the one bright spot in the market is those luxury phones, those high price phones that go for $900 or more. And that's really Apple's sweet spot. It's done very well in the U.S. with those phones and in the past year or so, done really well in China. And that is part of, uh, part of the success with this new round of 5G phones that Tim Cook has brought out. CNBC contributor Tim Higgins of The Wall Street Journal. Appreciate you walking us through the new phone. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for making time for us. You can send us your thoughts on the new iPhone or any of the questions or topics we discussed tonight. We are at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also use that other function on your phone to actually call us and leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. You can do that on your phone, too. Harry Smith will be in the chair tomorrow. I am off to the annual convention of the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association in Chicago. I will be back on Monday. But until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. See you then. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.